Hello and welcome to Backstage with Gig Performer. My name is Brett Pontecorvo. You might know me from these weekly live streams or perhaps I've come across your feed through Live Keyboardist. And in either case, we are so happy that you are here. Um, as you are coming in, go ahead and let us know where you're tuning in from. And actually, the question of the day today, mostly just to satiate my own curiosity, what plugin do you use the most? Like if you had to pick one plugin that was the one that you used most often, what would it be? I think for myself, it's probably contact, like some iteration of some contact instrument. And most often, my go-to piano sound is the grandeur, because uh, I think it's really multifaceted, really useful. So let us know in the comments uh, what you use most often. We'd love to hear from you. And we also have some very exciting news because uh, KVR Audio, for those of you who know the website, has recently added a new category to their uh, nominations for for the year. And uh, what's cool about that is in years past, there was no dedicated category for live performance software, which is what Gig Performer is, right? There's Ableton, which is more of a DAW, but uh, then there's a whole new category of um, category of software that is used specifically for performing live. So we would love it if you would take a moment to nominate Gig Performer uh, for this category. And actually, it's pretty easy to do. Before we jump in to our special guest today, Jim Irwin, I'm actually going to walk you through how to do it. It'll only take uh, just a second. And if you're watching and you feel so inclined to do it now, you could certainly follow along with me um, as we do it. So I'm going to pull this up here for you, um, but this is KVR's website. So if you search KVR Audio, um, this will certainly come up. And at the very top, you'll see a login button. So I'm going to click login. Um, and then I'm going to log in. And oh, goodness. We're in a, the beauty of going live. There we go. Fantastic. So um, up here at the top, they have a banner that basically says nominate your favorites. And what they're saying is, of course, your favorite of whatever it is in any particular category. So at the very top, you will see favorite developer. Um, and if you type in Deskew, you will be nominating uh, the good folks at uh, Gig Performer. But if you continue to scroll down, you will see a category favorite software for live performance. And you'll just type in here, Gig Performer, um, and it will auto-populate Gig Performer for you. Um, you can click on it. Make sure you're clicking Gig Performer 4.5, which I guess I can't click on again because um, I've already clicked on it once. Um, and then once you do that, you are good to go. This is how you nominate us. We would greatly appreciate it. And that actually will really help get the word out about gig performer. So if you want other people to kind of experience uh, what it means to have freedom and really own the stage when you're playing, this is a really easy way for you to do that. So we've actually got some answers coming in already. Um, let's see here. We've got, uh, okay, um, Impulse Music, Contact, Nexus, and Halion 6. Yes, fantastic. Uh, we've got Frode, Frode, Frode? I use Helix Native a lot. Yes, I've heard lots and lots about Helix Native. Dave Bolden, my most used plugin is likely Piano Tech for just about all acoustic and electric pianos and then pigments for synths. Yes, love pigments. IK Hammond and Arturia, love it. Friends, thank you so much. If you're coming in later and you want to add in your most used VST, definitely do so. But today, <laughs> without further ado, we have a fantastic guest coming on. Uh, if you are in the community forums, um, his name is Xpansion. Um, with an actual X, and he's a major contributor there. Uh, but he's coming on today to talk about using Gig Performer as a multi-instrumentalist. And I think you'll see, uh, as he begins to share with us, that he is not only concerned uh, about getting the music out into the world, but he's really focused on using Gig Performer as a way to empower his actual live performance show. Right? It's like, it's his tool for making the show 
awesome. Um, he is a former Forte user, which I am sure we will cover. Um, and he's playing all over. We're actually going to let him talk a little bit about that because hopefully you can connect with him. And I don't want to spoil too much else. So without further ado, we are going to welcome on our special guest for today, Jim Irwin. Uh, Jim, welcome to the stream. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Brett. And thank you for the for the great intro. I appreciate that as well. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. So, Jim, first of all, for folks who don't know you, I've given them a little bit of context, but how long have you been playing music? Uh, music's not your day job. Music is your night job. Yeah, it, be, well, music was my day job for about nine years. So okay. from age 22 to roughly 31, I okay. was making the majority of my income playing music. I was making hundreds of dollars a year after taxes, literally. <laughs> uh, and, of course, right. <laughs> and of course, gear expenditures, right? And, yeah. and traveling fairly heavily. Um, but, yeah. but as far as being in music, uh, I, you know, there's actually a recording of me uh, during Christmas time when I was three years old singing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and I grew up in a very musical family. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was very blessed. I'm, I'm the youngest of five. Mm -hmm. And in my family, it wasn't a question of what instrument do you play? It was how many do you play? Uh, so, sure, sure. you know, my sister, Christine, originally went to, to college on a full ride scholarship playing violin. Oh, wow. uh, and, and so she was violin, guitar, piano, uh, her twin, Kathy, uh, guitar, flute, piano. Twins. And yeah. Oh, well, that's the first set of twins. The second set of twins, what? my my brother and sister, Blaine and Lisa Blaine, uh, guitar, piano, singing. Uh, and then Lisa, Lisa sings and plays piano some, but she actually got a degree in modern dance from TCU. So we've always considered that like that other instrument. Sure. Uh, yeah. So I grew up with them playing music around the house all the time and also introducing me to all sorts of popular and in some cases what was not the popular music of the time. My parents listened to soundtracks and jazz constantly. It was just, mm -hmm. and, my, and my dad was in radio for more than 25 years. So again, wow, okay. music was just, music was just part of our culture in our family. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting how like, you, you know, when you experience it young enough, it kind of just gets in, in the wiring in some, in some fashion, which is really yeah. cool. Yeah. So tell us a little bit, I actually forget where you are located. This is the so one thing I, I didn't write down. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the Kansas City area. I live in gotcha. a suburb called Shawnee, Kansas. Yeah. Uh, and that's where my band Suburbans is based out of three of the six of us on stage. Actually, I guess uh, we, have, we have four of the six of us on stage now living uh, in Shawnee. Okay. Uh, so there's, there's one particular club not too far from here uh, called Barley's that we play at typically on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we, we refer to that as home field advantage because we're the local boys around sure. there, right? Sure. Uh, or should I say local local boys in one gal? Uh, <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, we, we based out of the Kansas City area, most of what we do is all around here. We don't travel that much out of town because all of us have fairly significantly busy and high profile day jobs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. But there's still opportunity to make music, which is, oh, yeah. is fun, right? So I, sometimes I find people will just write themselves off. It's like, well, you know, I have, you know, these 16 things that I'm responsible for, so I don't have time for it. And I'm like, well, that, you know, you could have time for it if you, if you wanted to, right? It's possible. Um, so there you go. You've One got... of the things I really appreciate about my boss, who has promoted me twice in the last few years, nice. is that he knows the question's always going to be, does this promotion mean I can't keep playing? Yeah. Because he knows how important it is to me. And that yeah. it's really, to me, music is not just something you do. It's something you are. And, and it's, it's just like breathing air. Without that, you might as well just, you know, stick a fork in me. I'm done. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. So for you, it's been a long, it's been your whole life. So at some mm -hmm. point, you are performing pre any software at all. Um, yes, that is correct. So yeah. I, you know, I, I started performing professionally when I was 22. Okay. So that was a number of years ago. We'll just say the eighties. Yeah, right. Sure. Uh, and my, my original keyboard rig was just a, a Korg DW8000, a DW6000 and a Yamaha DX21. Yep. Um, and, and that's what I used again, you know, to some extent, 
those are all computers, right? There's Absolutely. there's there's some type of CPU brain in there. There's digital storage. There's all of those things. Um, but as I evolved as a working musician over the years, uh, I eventually made my primary workstation uh, a Korg. E I'm sorry, an Insonic EPS 16 plus. And I was like, I can't do this from floppy disks. So I immediately got a SCSI drive to load all my samples from. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and really what I learned over a period of time is that's a fairly powerful limited instruction set computer. Mm -hmm. It's actually one of the things that gave me the confidence to move into the career I have now in, uh, in software engineering. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it, was a, it, was a, it was kind of a logical step and just you know, also people just, gave me opportunities along the way. It was actually a, uh, a, a very big fan of the band that I, I actually bought the SCSI drive from him yeah. that gave me my first opportunities in this business. Wow. It's crazy how certain things lead to places you wouldn't have thought, right? I mean, <laughs> so were you, did you end up being an early adopter of like laptop performing or at um, what point did you convert over? So you were performing professionally for almost yeah, ten years. Yeah, I assume you took a bit of a break. I did take a break. Um, I, you know, I got married, got the day job, wanted to take that career very seriously, and yeah. and and make sure that you know I had a chance to build that without the distraction. It's not like I wasn't playing at all at home, but sure. I was not playing out. So you know, after being used to playing. 250 to 300 shows a year yeah um going to not playing much that was a a, a bit of a challenge uh yeah, and course. but um yeah I, I took that break built the career started a family bought mm -hmm. a house all of those things mm -hmm. uh and then eventually uh the band i was with the longest called ace high that was the one that i bought the the eps 16 plus with mm -hmm. We started doing some re reunion shows starting back in 2005, and that was the first time I ever introduced an actual computer to my rig. Um, so uh, that why was did fun. you choose to do that? Just because you knew it was possible, or like how did you end up making that choice? Um, I wanted the virtual instruments, to be honest with you, and, okay. and and so I started looking at various options of how I could approach that. I mean, I'd used some DAWs at that point, but mm -hmm. I had never really found something that I felt was a live performance host. Yeah. And I was looking around, and I totally a windows guy for you know decades right yes i'm um, happy to hear you've converted yeah um, well which I, we'll talk I, about I more too. yeah we'll talk <laughs> about more about that but, but um at the time as i was looking around it seemed like the logical choice for a live host was brainspawn forte yep so uh, i i got a licensed copy of forte you know i found out that mark kelly from marillion was using that in his live rig and i'm like if this is stable enough for a marillion show mm -hmm. then it's stable enough for me uh, it was not on a laptop. I actually didn't start using laptops for a while. So I had this big desktop that sat on top of my rack sideways, right? Because it yep. was a tower. But I had yep. it sitting sideways with a big CRT monitor on top of it. And, yeah. uh, and, and that's, that's what I used for my virtual stuff at that point. Okay. And uh, was it a mix of hardware and software? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I've actually been a mix of hardware and software ever since I started using you know, a live performance host and using VSTs hmm. until, quite frankly, last Saturday. So last oh. Saturday was wow. my very first all hosted plugins show ever. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. So tell me a little bit more. Were you Forte straight through to gig performer? Did you have a tenure yeah. anywhere else or? No, I mean, so when, when, uh, when the vendor for Forte shut down shop, right. And I was yeah. a power user and was very much involved in the forums for that. You know, that's one of the things that I've loved about gig performer is also Forte for an extended period of time had a really great user community that helped each other and mm -hmm. the vendor was very responsive to the forum. So uh, he sold his customer list to the Cantable guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I got an offer to get into Cantable for you know half price or something like that for the first year and decided to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it's, it's a bad platform. It's just, it just didn't speak to me. Sure. Even though the, the, the overall paradigm is closer to what Forte is compared to Gig Performer. 
it just really didn't speak to me. And it seemed overly complex to do certain things that I found very easy to do in Forte. Mm -hmm. Um, In addition to that, I I just, I don't know. It just, it just didn't sit right. And so I started looking at uh, various other options. Um, I didn't actually download it and try it, but I considered Live Professor as another option. Uh Um, I considered I might use something like Ableton. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it just, again, it, for what I wanted to do with live performance, it didn't make sense. So mm-hmm. then I found, I, I started looking at the community forums for gig performer and found a number of my former Forte colleagues on the community forums there. Wow. So you started active. before you downloaded gig performer, you started on the forum. Yes. Oh, wow. absolutely. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. I feel like that speaks a lot or like there, there's, for those of you who are watching, there's like a hidden tidbit of wisdom in there where like how much you can learn about something just from watching the conversation going on about it around the internet. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Anyway, continue. So you're yeah, in the yeah. forums, so, you so discovered the Forte forums, users. Discovered Forte users. And there was actually uh, either a blog post or just a, a, a forum post about converting from Forte to gig performer by, yeah. by another former. And I would love to say, I remember who it was. I don't, but mm-hmm. I can tell you this, it was very helpful, yeah. but I did struggle early on with that transition. And the thing is, is I kept using Forte uh, at the time I had a rack mount windows PC. That's actually part of my old rig that you'll, you'll show mm-hmm. the pictures of, but mm-hmm. um, that's a custom built windows PC. I put together specifically for live performance of music and it has a four bay removable cartridge drive bay. So mm-hmm. a back plane on there so I can swap out drives on it. So I kept the Windows 7 drive for mm-hmm. it for Forte because I found some stability issues for me with certain plugins on Windows 10. Okay. I actually still have that drive. I could still plug it in today and go back to my entire old rig if I needed to. Wow. Um, yeah. But, but anyway, um, so I still have that still have the windows 10 drive that's working in there with gig performer and i've been using for the last you know three plus years okay uh but i was having problems uh and then uh dave j actually uh helped me out significantly we ended up having a a really nice conversation uh right after the chiefs lost the afc championship back in i guess that was 2018 yes 2019 yeah and uh He was preparing literally to go to NAMM the next day. Wow. It still took time to have a conversation and and try and explain to me the differences in how I should be approaching Gig Performer. And I got to tell you, such a a great guy, a great reach out, Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I just kept posting and I just, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't getting it because I was trying to over think gig performer Mm. um it wasn't so much that i was trying to think of it being forte i was trying to think of it as a programmer and not as a musician yeah and that's that's one of the great things about gp you can approach it as a programmer and more so now after you know 3.x and gp script came out and all of that yeah but i i was really looking at it from a programmer standpoint and and way overthinking it yeah it was also that conversation where he brought up he goes you're using windows <laughs> and i go yes and he goes hold on you're doing music you're a software engineer and you're using windows and i said yes <laughs> and and he and he he was the one that planted the seed to eventually move to mac this has taken all this time to get there yeah yeah it is it's a jump they're different languages mm-hmm. oh, let, so you you must have been an early gig performer user then were you on version two when you started I was I, I started building my first rack spaces in whatever the last full release version of 2.x was. Okay. And then th- uh, 3.x came out and I was in that grace period where I got it free because I had yes. purchased my license too far before that, which which again I was very appreciative of. Yeah. But 3 as soon as 3.x came out, I jumped on it immediately because there were a couple of things that I felt were missing from 2.x that was going to make things a little more difficult for me. The number one feature they introduced in 3.x that just made all the difference in the world was set list view. And being able to build sets very quickly and easily. As a matter of fact, you know, I could build set lists in Forte, but I can build them way faster 
in gig performer, the, the type of head feature to find the song and being mm -hmm. able to do it all with keyboard. I never even touched the mouse yep. when I'm building a set list and it's just rapid fire. It's so fast. Mm -hmm. It's so fast. Um, I'm like side tangent for those of you who have any interest in this, but like one of the, like my favorite things of all time is like networked, like note taking software. Like that's my hobby. Mm -hmm. And when I use, um, set list view and gig performer the the way that it auto fills what you're doing feels a lot like the way those programs feel to me and it it really does like you can put together a set list in minutes i mean it's especially if you're keeping everything saved in in a particular set right like uh, or a, a gig file rather okay so that wow this is fascinating so you were 2.0 you mm -hmm. three came on setless view was happening. And so you were full on into gig oh, performer yeah. at that point you were a hundred percent in. Oh yeah. Well, and so it, it was, uh, April of 2019, I think was my first show with gig performer. And yeah. it was just an amazing difference from everything I was used to being. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Was it before that? Ah, I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It was either 2018, 2019, you know, as you get to my, be my age, those years get a little blurred sometimes. <laughs> But, sure. but, but but when I made that first jump, the show just went so, so smooth. Mm -hmm. And and it, it was just amazing. And and the band was also very impressed with everything that was going on with the changes. Yeah. Do you find that you've had like a, a mental sh shift from using Gig Performer? Like, do you feel less concerned with your gear? Uh, yes, definitely. Actually, gig performer is the thing I worry about the least. Okay. Uh, you know, one of the one of the motivators for switching from the old rig to the new rig is the age of the keyboards that I was using. Mm. And, um, you know, the Kronos, which I love, it's a beast. It's an amazing instrument and I'm not going to get rid of it. But as far as using it live, you know, I've had some reliability issues. I've had to open it up and I've, I've broken keys. I've had to reseat the RAM multiple times. And it's mm -hmm. just, I, I had some issues with the USB port on it, locking up the, the keyboard while I was playing. And I would have to, compl because I had USB running into the computer straight as the MIDI input to Gig Performer, then I had to shut in its windows, right? So it right. doesn't redetect that it's back. Mm -hmm. So it just, I had to completely reboot the Kronos and then I would have to quit and restart Gig Performer as well. And wow. that type of interruption from a live perspective is just, it. you can't do that, right? You can't take 10 minute break and just reload stuff. Yeah. Um, and then the, so I, I ended up switching to using a USB MIDI interface Mm -hmm. on uh, and then using straight USB cables on the Kronos that that solved that particular problem but just again occasionally it would get a little freaky and you know the Facebook groups I belong to for the Kronos there are just certain things that it's known to have issues with and there's known fixes but I just can't afford that in a live setting Yep. Uh, Dave Bolden wrote in, he had to open up his Kronos to wiggle the RAM modules a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And I yeah. feel like I've seen this in the forums a couple of times where mm -hmm. people will be like, what happened? And it's like, yep, yeah, the Kronos. Plus okay. also getting parts for either my Phantom X7 or my Kronos is becoming ever more difficult. And, and I just don't want to tie myself to that problem anymore. Yeah. David, did you want me to pull you in? Yeah, uh, we're going to bring David in. Okay, please. How's it going, David? Uh, it's going great. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, to the your, uh, your audio is uh, click, click, clicking. I don't know why. You can't hear me properly? Uh, we can hear you. It's just got a little static to it. I, I don't I don't know why. Hi, good morning, Jim. I just wanted to make a quick comment because you're demonstrating something that we've been claiming for years, and this argument always comes up with the... Um, in, in, in the music communities, everyone has, or many people have this feeling of oh, my hardware is much more reliable than a software based system. And it absolutely is not. And in fact, these days, the way people throw laptops around and they still keep running, I think it's almost quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, 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 I just think that's a very important point. Yeah. From, from yeah. my experience, that is definitely the case now. And it wasn't that way 
in my early days of using, you know, Forte and, and VSTs, and I don't think that was a Mac first PC thing or anything. I think it was just the nature of the beast of the hardware back then. And also you were using physical hard, you know, mechanical hard drives versus SSDs, which that changed the game significantly. And also the load times for samples in particular went light speed comparatively. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also the case it's easier to carry a spare laptop as a backup instead of a spare Chronos. Oh, absolutely. And and admittedly, my, my second, my, my backup MacBook Pro is not quite as capable as my main one, but still can get the job done. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to, I think that's a very important point. Uh, so I just wanted to get it no, out. No, yeah. Thanks for popping on. If you do come back on, switch to your built-in microphone. To be that's continued. Right. I only have one. Oh, your MacBook. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll you pull, pull you back in. Um, so, um, okay. So you, Kronos is gone. Um, great. We, we won't call it gone. We'll just call it retired. Retired. It's yeah, retired. It's retired, yeah. It's retired. I love it. Yeah. Um, we got Marty Wade popping in. I just wanted to shout out to him. He actually just recently did a video uh, using Gig Performer uh, for his keytar. Thanks for being here, Marty. Okay, so you've got you got Kick Performer running. Mm -hmm. Let's let's talk a little bit about your setup. Like, okay. what are you using now? What's the hardware that's included? Why did you pick what you have? And also, you sorry, this is two questions. We might have to okay. break this apart. But okay. you moved from Windows to Mac, which is yes. massive. Yes. Why don't you tell me about that first? How was so, that? So, well, first off, um, let's talk about the reasons why I switched from Windows to Mac. And, and, and I am not a Windows basher by any means because I have done several very successful years using Windows as my platform live. However, you have to tweak the hell out of Windows to mm -hmm. get it to really perform well as a live audio host because mm -hmm. the Windows sound system, yes, they've made some improvements over the last few years, but the Windows sound system does not consider audio as a first-class citizen. It's really a bolt-on. Um, mm -hmm. And even with the improvements they've made, you st DPC latency and other types of latency issues are something you are constantly working around. With the Mac, Core audio is a first class citizen of the operating system, and I'm able to get far lower latency without clipping or distortion or nastiness on the MacBook than I was ever able to get out of my Windows box. Now, admittedly, I have a fairly new MacBook Pro, mm -hmm. but also, you know, my 2019, which is my backup, mm -hmm. um, it also just lower latency, more stability, um, less I have to mess with to try and get that type of lower latency out of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Ma makes a ton of sense. Makes a mm -hmm. ton of sense. And, uh, I, you know, for Ableton, I remember like reading all of the stuff that people were going through just to get it working on a Windows machine. And it was quite a lot. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was really a good amount. Um, okay, so I, I feel like that's pretty compelling just if you're like trying to decide if you should or shouldn't make that switch just having audio be more regarded by the operating system. Yeah, it's just, it's a first class Pretty, citizen. So it's yeah. a primary concern of how the OS works in the first place. And the fact that I don't have to rely on ACO drivers anymore, because again, yeah. for each interface that you may use, and I went through a lot of them to get to something I felt was cons consistently stable and low enough latency, which mm -hmm. is the same one I'm using today with Mac. Uh, I use a Behringer XR18. Mm -hmm. um, and I use that as a, a combination keyboard submix. Of course, I was using it for the audio outs of my X7 and my Kronos. Yes. Um, and also my audio interface. But I also, and I'll show this a little later on, I also use it for a lot of routing purposes in terms of how my live rig works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Um, and actually, I've heard people using the Behringer for that before, mm -hmm. which is kind of like a cool possibility or it's good to know um okay amazing so take us through what's what's next so you're on mac now yep and how is it, it working it is working fantastically and i gotta also say you know i i was i was initially hesitant to go with you know the new apple silicon yeah 
but this M1 Pro, it's like it just works. And yeah. there's, it, I, I, even with some of my most elaborate setups, I never see my CPU go over maybe 60, 65%. Wow. But it stays cool on top of that. Wow. And I actually had an issue at the first show. I didn't realize it until we were halfway through the first set, but I had not plugged in because I use a USB-C power cable that I just carry rather than the, the fast charge. I know this yep. may sound silly, but the main reason is because I wanted a black cable and not a white one because most of my gear is black. Yeah. It's, a, it's an aesthetic, but I hadn't yeah. quite plugged it in all the way. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I was not getting... So I ran on battery for the first set last Saturday night. No problems. And it barely ate the battery. I just yeah. was... It, it was very impressive. Yep. Yep, I found similar things. So, can I actually throw some pictures on the screen yeah, right now, yeah, and you yeah. can talk us through maybe what um, what what uh, what we're looking at? So, if I'm correct, this is your old set. Is that true? That is my old setup. So, up top, that's the Phantom X7. Yeah, I have been using a Phantom X7 in my live rig since 2007. So, the second round of uh, Ace High reunions we did is when I introduced that keyboard. It's because my DW8000 just it had been road hard and put away wet back in my gigging days and it yeah. was just not reliable enough for stage anymore. Gotcha. So I, that was the first new keyboard I bought in a long time. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's been through hell and back with me. Yep. And yep. then below, below that is my, my 2011 Kronos. I actually, yep. even though that you have some more capabilities on the newer Kronos, like the Kronos two, et cetera, you get some extra uh, disc space, some extra sounds. I don't like the aesthetic of it with those wooden end caps. I, and again, I'm an aesthetics guy. I want something that looks good. People don't, people don't talk about going to hear a band. They talk about going to see a band. That's so right. anything I can do visually to make that a better story, more appealing, more exciting, things like that. I want it to look sleek. I want it to look cool, right? Yep. And, so, and that's what people say. That is the language they use. Yeah. They don't, they always say going to see. Right, right. Very interesting thing you point out. Okay, so it was are these, oh, actually, Dave just wrote in that this is the exact setup he was using. Interesting, um, interesting. Yeah, so it's a powerful setup. And were mm -hmm. these things plugged into uh, your Windows? Is this your Windows? Yeah. Right so, over here? so yeah. If you look, if you look just below the 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 piece of wood there that I haven't painted yet, that's that's my custom built PC. Gotcha. There used to be some wireless devices directly underneath it, but th I've got my 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 second XR18 is sitting underneath the computer right now on top of the UPS. And yes. I believe in using a pure sign, uh, pure sign wave UPS for my most critical gear at every show. So for both those keyboards, of, the for, XR for people who are not watching, uh, for people who may not know, can you tell us what that is and why? Yeah, an uninterruptible, an uninterruptible power supply, or a lot of people will call it a battery backup. Mm -hmm. But there is a significant difference I learned actually helped with people uh, from the community of, of gig performer from the community mm -hmm. forums. I had a gig in which I kept losing contact between the computer and the audio interface. And it was one of the first shows that I, it was, I think it was the third show I used gig performer on. And it was just a nightmare and, and almost a disaster. I mean, it was one of the most stressful, sweating, trying to figure out what can I do with my two physical keyboards. And it all turned out to be a power issue. So I used to buy a cheaper uh, single rack mount space UPS that was simulated sine wave, not pure sine wave. Mm. And I actually had just gotten a replacement one when apparently I plugged into some bad juice that it just couldn't handle enough and it, and it wreaked havoc with my rig. And it just, it was, it was a bad night. And so came out to the community forum said, Hey, had this disaster with gig performer and everybody started asking questions and between everyone responding, we nailed it down to I needed a pure sine wave UPS for some of the clubs I was playing in because they were old buildings, bad juice, pure sine wave would take care of it. it costs about twice the money, but I got to tell you, for the peace of mind, worth every penny. And I have one in both my old rack and my new rack. Um, yeah. Because, again, I'll still use stuff in that old rack down here, you know, in my studio. But I want it to be safe. I want it to be protected. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to see if I can 
Oop, this is a little funky. Well, yeah, it doesn't work the way that I wanted it to. That's okay. All right, let's put this back on the screen because you actually okay. have more gear. Yeah, that we can show. So and then, okay, and then so, and so inside the rack is the is the is the custom built rack mount PC. Then my XR18 sitting underneath that. I I moved some of the wireless stuff out of there into the new rig uh, that I had just gotten before that. And then I also um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, and then I got some other new wireless stuff that I debuted at the same show that I debuted the new rig. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was I was truly working without a net and uh, risking all sorts of disaster to happen. But I was just like, you know, I, I set this date in stone for the new rig. I'm not going to go past it. I'm going to make this happen today. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then, in terms of stands, you know, that's just the stands I use down here for that rig. Yep. Uh, you know, the 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 Spider Pros are what I use live. I have two sets of those. Um, I have one down here in the basement that's silver, that's for my practice rig, and I've got one out in the garage that I I just keep only for the live rigs, and it's black. Mm -hmm, uh, and mm -hmm. again, I actually like everything possible in my rig to be black, and I wish my MacBook Pro was black i mean it's the one silver thing that you can see on stage mm -hmm. uh if you if you take a look at it from the angle i play at mm -hmm. um, so I, I wish i had that but that's you know that's okay I, yeah I, I can live with that maybe i'll find a cover for it or something there, there you go i was just gonna say i feel like you yeah. can definitely get a cover or some paint yeah yeah, as so, everybody shrieks at the idea of painting yeah, a computer but yeah. <laughs> and then of course you can see that there's a monitor on top uh and and a keyboard and mouse because you absolutely have to have that when you're dealing with a rack mount right you you got to have something to view on that's external as well as the keyboard and mouse yep absolutely so you've replaced this now yeah with this right and just so everybody knows yes i have a monitor showing in this picture but I only use that monitor when I'm programming down here or practicing down here in the basement. Yeah. So when I take the live rig out, just take the monitor, keyboard, uh, and mouse out of the picture. It's not there. And then that secondary rack with the mixer you see right there stays here in the studio. So I actually gotcha. have, that's a, that's a Midas MR18, which is a slightly better version of the XR18. Okay. Uh, same software works with both. Routing on it is fantastic. And right now, that's got all of the auxiliaries out from the XR18 I'm using for my live rack uh, plugged into it. And then it is plugged into this computer that I'm actually talking to you from because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not talking to you or, or, or conversing or the sound is not going to, uh, to StreamYard from directly from that keyboard rig over there. Gotcha. And so got the MacBook Pro up there and I got the specific laptop stand. And yep. I actually have two of them so that I don't have to tear one down to take with me. Um, yep. So I've got that. Uh, then on uh, the top keyboard is a Roland FA07. Now, yes, the FA07 has a sound engine, but currently I am not using that sound engine in the live rig, and I'm not intending to use it. I'm really using it strictly as a controller. But if something disastrous were to happen to the computer and I can't recover, I can quickly plug that in and use that. I also, for like uh, the Purple Jam, which I, I wrote about, you know, being part of and gig performer in action a, a ways back, I actually did not use the XR18. I instead, sorry, spam call. Oh, um, so uh, I did not use the XR18. I actually used the audio interface on the FA07 instead. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then, so, yeah, keep going. Then, then on top, on the top left-hand corner, that's a Novation launch control. So I use that both for switches that are tied to widgets, as well as for uh, holding notes and other things that I've done previously. Also, the left-right button on that are hooked up to the next song, previous song functions in Gig Performer to just make it easy for me to step through things as I go through the night. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, that's a great little controller, too. Oh, um, yeah. Is there a reason that you picked these two keyboards? I see you were mentioning the sound engine, but like... Yeah. The FA07 is just kind of fun. 
Okay. It's got some interesting sampling features and kind of rapid, it, the workflow of how it works in building songs and stuff is kind of fun. Okay. Uh, I, I generally liked the sounds. I yep. definitely wanted a 76 note keyboard and also it weighs next to nothing. So that was one of the big goals also of the, the switch in the rig is I wanted to reduce the weight I was carrying to shows. And I literally reduced my total weight of everything I'm carrying by almost 60 pounds wow. building the new rig. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. A ton of weight. Okay. So this, this is, this is great. This is a very clear setup here. What, yeah. what else do you have? So you've got some pedals rocking. What, what are you doing yeah. with these? Okay. So down here, I've got two of the smaller version of the Dunlop uh, pedals. So those are two expression pedals. The left pedal is attached to, I, I always look at left to right as top to bottom. Okay. So the left expression pedal and the far left of the sustain pedals there, right? Yep. Those are both connected to the FA07. Gotcha. And then the middle pedal and the right pedal, uh, and that's a, a Studio Logic, uh, what is it, a VFP3 or something like that? Yeah, VFP3. Yep. Um, that's a three pedal Studio Logic, fantastic pedals. Love the feel of them, built really, really, really well. At some point I'll replace the cabling on them because I've just found that almost any sustain pedal you buy on the market, uh, the, the cables are particularly cheap and don't okay. last. Sure. Uh, and I'm pretty hard on pedals. Although now on the pedal board, I have a soft case for this pedal board. It used to be that I carried my pedals all separately taped them down at every gig, wrapped cables around them. I don't have to do that with how I transport this anymore. Mm -hmm. And then the right expression pedal is hooked up to the bottom keyboard as well. The bottom keyboard is a Native Instruments Complete Control S88, and it's the Mark I version. So it's the one, not quite as much display on it, um, but it's got the ribbon controllers instead mm -hmm. of the wheels. And I really always wanted something with the ribbon controller. And I had this long before I bought the Kronos. This actually used to be the bottom keyboard in the rig before I bought the Kronos. So, and, and I also just really, really have missed having a full 88 notes, particularly when doing certain piano pieces, right? Yep. But, but even with the way I do splits and layers and, and move things across the keyboards, I always have a design goal to make it to where I have a single rack space per song. And I'm not saying that's the right way or wrong way to do it. Mm -hmm. It's just the way that speaks to me the best. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, having 88 on the bottom and 76 on top makes that a lot easier. Right. And also like having the consistency of it. Like yes. if you're taking the one rack space per song approach, like the reduction in mental friction of just making the choice, this is the way I'm going to do it. It's really helpful. As it says, this is how we do it. You know, right. yeah. we got to add that one to your set. Yeah, we actually do do that song. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. But uh, I, I, yeah. So, and then in the rack, um, uh, the I rack. have. Wait, do I go back? It's okay. Yeah, here? go back. Yeah. So in okay. the rack, um, we've got up top uh, two Sennheiser wireless devices. The one on the left is the newer EWD. Uh, uh, wireless uh, system, and I have that for this headset microphone, so that's in use right now for us. Yep. Uh, and then the one directly to its right, which I'm not using right now, is the uh, is the EWG4 uh, in ear system. That's mm -hmm. that's actually my newest piece of wireless gear, mm -hmm. uh, and that that was the first show I ever used it at. I've actually had the EWD for about a month and a half. And uh, it has just been awesome. I love that piece of gear. And my range on it has just been amazing. Yeah. Um, and then... Because awesome. you, you move around. You also have a keytar hidden. Oh, yeah. Not shown here, right? Yeah. I have a... Yeah, the keytars. And I, I'm actually going to use the keytar in a little demo. Great, great. Um, you know, because again, we're talking about multi-instrumental, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then below the two Sennheiser devices, I've got a Shure SLX-D4. Uh, and so that's what I'm using for my guitar wireless. That used to be my headset wireless, but the transmitter device on it had problems and it was still under warranty, but it was going to take, you know, like two, two and a half months potentially before I would get it back. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I can't wait on this. So that's why I ended up buying 
the uh, the the EWD for my wireless headset, and and once I got the the SLXD back, then I moved that and repurposed it as my guitar wireless because it's it's a way better wireless than what I was using previously. Awesome. And wow. then okay. underneath that, yep, uh, you can see I've got my other uh, Pure Sine Wave UPS. It's a Cyber Power, uh, and I've been using these for years. They've been just fantastic. Uh, and then what you can't see in the rack back inside and mounted to the back, but with the face facing forward to the rack is my XR18. And I bought some custom rack ears for that that have holes on either side. So as you see all those colored cables coming around the side mm -hmm. and plugging into my MR18, those are actually coming through those holes in the back, but those are coming from the six auxiliaries on the XR18. Normally, those six are being sent to front of house. You've mm -hmm. got mono, mono vocal, so you know this, this microphone here. Um, you've got vocoder mono, then you've got stereo left and stereo right keyboards, then mono guitar, and then we're not using a click for anything I've got programmed up on the, on the rig yet, but occasionally we will use a click, and so auxiliary six is the click, so that that way everybody can mix all this stuff in their in-ears that they want as they want to and our front of house sound man uh jack roberts who's amazing um he also uh can you know really kind of tweak things and, and individualize that mm -hmm. we got a question coming in here that i think yeah. is relevant okay chris bartley i'm a piano snob what do you think of the feel of the native instruments key bed and can you use the color keys to show splits you set up in gig performer so um the feel is, if you're a piano snob, I think you probably won't be a big fan of it, but mm -hmm. I'm not a piano snob. I'm a, you know, I really look at, there's a pianist and there's a keyboard player, and there are pianists who are also keyboard players, but there are lots of keyboard players that are not pianists. Sure. And, yep. and, and from a piano standpoint, having that right feel for the perfect dynamic articulation, knowing when the hammer is going to come over, et cetera, right? Those are all really important things. For me, less important. You know, I'll admit though, Chris, um, back in '94, I was playing a house gig at this uh, at this really upscale restaurant and bar on the Country Club Plaza here in Kansas City for a year, and I got to play a full size Steinway concert grand five nights a week and wow. my piano skills grew amazingly during that time but I'm still I, I would not call myself a piano snob mm -hmm. as far as the color keys to show splits you set up in GP it's funny you should ask that question um, the answer today is no because the software and the communication protocols to communicate with that feature on the NI keyboard is proprietary. It doesn't do it via SysX or any MIDI messages. Um, but I have entered into a uh, individual software development um, license with native instruments. And as I finish getting this rig all the way back up and running, I plan on creating a VST that is used explicitly for controlling how things look in terms of colors on the native instruments complete control series mm -hmm. so that is a that is a goal of mine i've already got the sdk uh, i have never written a vst in my life so it's going to be a little slow going but once i have that available as far as i'm concerned any of my uh, any of my fellow gig performer users i'm not looking to sell this thing mm -hmm. i plan on giving it away yeah. so it, it, but but also remember if it's free I, I also may not be like keen to a bunch of, you know, enhancement requests, or if you run into a bug, it's kind of use at your own risk. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm making it primarily for myself and it works. If it works for others, fantastic. I think that's how gig performer started. Um, Chris and writes in that he plays piano on 70 per five percent of his tunes. Yeah. Feel could be important. If you're watching right now and you have an opinion about the best feeling, not piano, piano, keyboard <laughs> uh let us know in the comments yeah. um, i'll tell you from my standpoint uh if i was really focusing on piano the roland keyboards in my opinion are are the best of a portable professional keyboard as yeah. far as on the other side keyboards that are fantastic for um 
in your home that you're not going to have to move. I can't remember the name of the series, but Yamaha has come out with this hybrid that actually uses almost a full mechanical action, but with a digital engine for the sound. And they are just amazing. Yeah. Yep. I haven't checked those out, but we'll make sure to link to yeah. that. I'll, we'll have somebody find that for us. So, um, yeah. okay. Let's, can we look at your gig performer setup? Are we ready? Yeah, to absolutely. Do that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I'm sure. going to put this on the screen here. Um, okay. Okay. So, and by the way, I'll, I'll be a little off screen while I do this. Cause I've got to, I've got to move over here and I don't have a good way to get the camera aimed that way. Totally fine. Um, so um, you've got my screen up. Yep. So this is, this is what we would refer to as a very basic set, right? This is one of my most basic songs that I play all night. You know, it's just basically a bread and butter piano and organ setup. But there's, you know, a couple of important notes here, right? Mm -hmm. um, number one, I kind of split between using contact for pianos. And while I do love the grandeur, if I want something really clean and beautiful, I think the grandeur is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But um, for a more down and dirty thing or something with a little more, I'm, I, I don't know. I love the Maverick. Um, mm -hmm. We had this Sergeant Cincinnati Pony Grand Piano in my house growing up that I learned on. And the first night I ever plugged in, or I, I loaded up the first version of Contact. I think it was seven. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, it, not Contact seven, but um, Complete seven. So that's the one that came out the first with the grandeur the maverick um i can't remember the other two off the top the gentleman and i can't remember the fourth one but that was the first version that came out with those and i I, I brought up the maverick i had headphones on i'm down in my basement everybody else was asleep at the time and i start playing and I swear I could close my eyes and I felt like I was transported back to that old music room being, you know, 15 years old, writing music for the first time. And and just I started playing everything I remembered from when I was a kid because it just spoke to me that way. Right. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. but I also use a piano V2 a lot from Arturia. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just kind of depends on what's my need. Is the sound of V2 good enough in a certain circumstance? Because I don't have to worry about sample load the same way that I do, um, because it's a it's a modeled piano instead of a sampled piano, right? Yep. So yep. if you take a look at the wiring, it's very simple on this one. Ah, come on, mouse. There we go. So if you look, I've just got MIDI and top keyboard, MIDI and bottom keyboard. So the piano is strictly on the S88. Mm -hmm. And then I use GSI VB32 for my organ these days. Um, I was a big user of the first version of this. And then I kind of mixed between that and the organ V2 from uh, Arturia as well. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm on this rig, uh, I'm, I'm strictly using that for my organs at this point, at least if they're not like a synthesized organ, right? Sure. Um, but uh, I, I love that. For the switch? Um, I just in general, I love the sound of version two. I wasn't going to introduce it to my old rig, knowing that I was building this one when I bought it. Mm. Um, but I, I, I just I was like, you know, I've always liked this and I'm kind of in a spending spree on the new rig. So I'm just going to go ahead and pony up and, and buy myself a license. I've tried some other organs. I've used the you know, I actually used to love um, oh, uh, B4 from native instruments that they uh -huh. discontinued after complete six, I think it was. Yeah. Um, that right. And, and it was not compatible with windows 10. So when I moved to gig performer and windows 10 and 64 bit and all of that stuff, I, I just, I couldn't use it anymore. I'd heard that there was a binary out there from an earlier version than the one I had that would work, but I was like, um, I just need to find an alternative. So that's when I started using the, the first version of GSI VB3. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan um, is writing in and wants to know how long it takes to initially load this rack space. Um, right. Uh, the rack space itself or my I entire think gig I file. I think he's asking the gig file would be my gut. Gig file is currently running two and a half to three minutes, mm -hmm. but I also have not finished every song that you see, every rack space you see listed here. Right mm -hmm. now, I have a subset of our set list that we basically wrote the set list to make it easier for me to hit my September 10th date last Saturday. Mm -hmm. Love my band leader, Keith Sorrow. He is 
very good to me when it comes to this stuff. He's also so, he's also my best friend, so it helps, you know. For anybody who's concerned about load time, we do have a predictive loading feature. I was meeting with somebody the other day. Turning that on really reduces how long it takes to open it. So if you're working in set list view, that is an option if that's a concern of you. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, can, it, continue. Yeah, it, well, also when it comes to predictive loading, just so you know, um, I actually have done this both with predictive and without predictive. It speeds it up by maybe a third, but it doesn't speed it up as much as I expected it to. It could mm -hmm. be something I'm doing, couldn't mm -hmm. tell you, but... Um, with my old Windows PC, I found, and, and 3.x, I found predictive loading to be unpredictable in terms of what might happen. Mm. So, uh, but also my Windows box had significantly more RAM than my MacBook Pro does. I've only got 16 gigs on the MacBook Pro. I had 32 on the Windows box. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I am also being a little more cognizant of how much I'm using sampling wise. And, but I'm not, worried about going to predictive loading i've really tried it both ways with this rack i've just chosen not to do it mm -hmm. for the time being until i really need it and the reason for the long loading time is we're getting ready to make sure that there is glitch-free instantaneous switching between racks so you you pay for it a little bit on the front end but you know massive rewards on the back end um for the whole time you're using it um okay all right. Uh, so, keep, so, so, keep anyway, so those two, and then I just, you know, audio mixer down here. Yep. This is kind of what I call a, uh, an earlier version of my standard keyboard template, my keyboard rack space template. Yep. But in all of those, I have a 16 channel mixer. I always have default the, the one and two, which is a mono input. So that's the one that I'm going to be typically sending guitar or vocoder to. Yep. Um, and then I've always got that going to outputs one and two down here. Oh, for uh, keyboard ones, because I would be using vocoder typically. So in five on my XR18, right? Uh, okay. So that set up as a USB channel. So it listens to USB versus to the analog input on the front, because you can do that on any of the channels on the XR18. Awesome. Then. I've got, uh, I've got Piano V2 coming through this gain and balance control. The reason for the gain and balance control is that any song that I know I'm going to be taking a solo, I want to make sure that solo is going to be heard. Right. So I have a widget on my front panel for boosting the gain that's tied to the third button from right on my Novation launch control. And because it's that type of a control change, you can also sync the lighting on that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. so, uh, and I'll, 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 you know, kind of show what that looks like here in just a minute. Um, but, uh, and then from a widget standpoint, I have left expression, right expression tied to the piano and to the organ swell left hold is actually then repurposed to the slow, fast rotary speed mm. on VB3. The reason I use that is because I got used to that going back to my days playing the EPS 16 plus and I had the dual pedal for that. And what was great about the dual pedal setup is if you were playing an organ sound and you had rotary speaker in your effects chain, you could assign fast and slow to the left pedal. Yep. And so that's why the left pedal for me is just it's just I got used to doing that, you know, playing 250 shows plus a year. It just it just makes sense to me. Yep. Uh, you can actually set a setting in VB3 to always take a you know basically CC64 and use that for the fast slow switch. I prefer to assign it myself specifically so that if I change my pedal setup, I can easily change that and remap it in the rig manager. Yep. And just it makes it a whole lot easier and, and more predictable in my opinion. Over and over and over again instance after instance it makes more sense to just use a widget right right <laughs> their situation proves it's like it will save you much grief at some yes. point yeah and, and then you know here's the solo boost and it comes in turned off and i have the value on that set opposite so basically off 
sends a hundred to turn to bypass the plugin, right? Gotcha. So basically, it's bypassed by default when I come into the rack. You'll also see this mic mute button, which is in almost every one of my rack spaces, and that's the far right pad on the Novation Launch Control to just be able to quickly mute this microphone. Mm -hmm. There's two different reasons to do that. Number one, I may want to take a drink. I may need to say something to somebody. I don't want to go over the microphone. Uh, or I may also want to turn off the microphone going to front of house so that the microphone strictly goes through the vocoder without mm -hmm. going through my voice coming through front of house. So I can control that real easily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then D-Beam isn't hooked up to anything on this one, but I, occasionally that's a fun control still to do. And that's another reason why I wanted a Roland keyboard up top. I just think the D-Beam is a fun visual to use, right? Sure. Um, I'm not really using it for anything right now, but again, you know, so I can just be playing, you know. And then if I hit that third button, then it basically gives it a 4 dB boost. So on right. that gain control, typically I'll start with a 4 dB and then I'll ask the front of house sound man later on. Was that the right lift? Was it too hot? Was it not hot enough? And then I, cause each song, it's typically going to be a little different based on the timbre of the tone, right? Sure. It's going to be a little bit different, or it could be that instead of putting something in like that, I actually need to do some EQing or something else. And so I can just put additional uh, effects in the chain. Uh, and that's one of the things I love about the audio routing and gig performer is just amazing, right? Yeah. It's just, it, yep. it is just so fantastic. So that's, that's a very basic setup. And like I said, the organ, you know, I just hit that left left pedal and that's my my slow and fast right yeah it, it, just, it just it works nicely yes and it's it's sort of i'm like watching you talk through this and i'm like it has only what you need yes exactly <laughs> my my panels tend to be fairly minimal compared to a lot of the elaborate ones i've seen other people do now i can tell you i'm going to borrow some ideas as i get deeper into this this journey into the new rig right yeah um, I, I love what NPUDAR did with um, that uh, metronome. Oh, the visual metronome? Yeah, the visual metronome. Mm -hmm. And so I plan on putting together the visual metronome because I know that all of us as players, or at least me, maybe if I was back playing five nights a week or something, I'd be a little more disciplined in this. Mm -hmm. But I'll get excited. And if I start a certain song, I may start it at way too fast of a tempo. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be on the money where it should be. And so I don't want to click track per se. Mm -hmm. I just want a visual metronome. So I plan on putting another rack panel right here that's mm -hmm. going to be that visual metronome. And then I will just make sure to set the appropriate tempo on each song in the set list, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I won't turn it on by default. I'll just have another button on my, uh, on my Novation that I can just turn it on and it will start up and I'm good to go. I find myself sometimes, or like a lot of the music I play, I'm, I'm running a click track. And um, depending on what tune you're doing, the band gets excited. And then all of a sudden, your level for the click track is no longer correct. Yes. You can't tell if you're in it or not. And I've thought I need to set one up for, for that particular gig file. Because I always find myself just looking at the outputs. Mm -hmm. at the bottom for the for the blinking of the the uh, metronome out which is fine but yeah this would be uh, it would be a nice addition well i um, used to use my phantom x for the click track yeah so it was a click sequence and it would take its tempo from gig performer but when i hit play you know they heard the click and i heard it too but i also had the visual representation so when i would see them going off mm -hmm. i would start like yeah. moving my body to, hey guys, it's here. Yeah, and yeah. they would look back at me from time to time to to check on that, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, now this is an even simpler one, but I just wanted to show you know again, you can you can go as simple as you want. This is literally one VST, one keyboard hooked up into one stereo input, and it because that's all you really need for the song, right? And if anybody remembers, I was looking for that sound. If anybody had it for a VST on the community forums, nobody had it, or at least nobody responded if they had it. So um, that's what I did. Why channel two and three? Um, 
the reason for channel two and three? Yeah, just what I chose when I was doing that specific song. Really, all of the channels by default go out through outputs 13 and 14, which go into 13 and 14 on my XR18. But I think it was just because it was all the way to the left on the VST. And so I just kind of drew it straight down. <laughs> so okay. yeah, sometimes, sometimes I have silly reasons for doing things, but you know, they're mine and they work. Okay, so let's take a look at something a little more. Now, I'll admit, this bottom panel, just ignore it. I'm actually not really using it. But um, blinded by the light. So this is where things start getting a little more intense, right? <laughs> so here, I'm using, I'm using contact for uh, the choir. You know, so it's like the Mellotron choir piece. I'm using it for the electric piano sound. That's the main opening part of the song. Um, yes, this is the Manfred Mann version. And, uh, and then I'm using GSI VB3 for the Hammond sound. And I'm using Serum. By the way, Serum is one of my new favorite plugins. Oh my gosh, yeah. I love it. It just speaks to the way that I work, but mm -hmm. as a wavetable synth. Because you know, I, I go from back in the old days of analog, right? I learned how to program initially on a modular that was custom built by a friend of my brother's. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and the first time i ever played that thing i was 12 years old i was hooked on synthesizers from then on i was like oh i yeah. gotta do some of this right yeah um so anyway um serum is for that you know that ramp up sound mm -hmm. so i've got on the and i'm gonna switch my um my camera view here real quick give me a sec so that you can see what i'm doing on the keyboard uh, there we go Okay, so this is keyboard view, right? So basically the song starts out, you know, with the with the electric piano up here, you know. But then, you know, you roll in the Hammond sound coming in with um, vibrato on slowly as you go, right? So you've got that, you've got that down here. So, you know. So we go, so it's like, you know, you got. But here's where the real magic comes in, is when I go down and start playing the combination of the Hammond and the Mellotron together, there was no way to just say, play this one note on this plugin, but play the other, all the notes on another plugin based on the different types of uh, intervals of the chords that you're playing, or uh, inversion, sorry, of the chords that you're playing. So this was actually a script that um, was heavily uh, helped and influenced by Piano Paul, another mm -hmm. fantastic member of the community forum. God, that guy helps everyone. He does. And, and knows yep. more about scripting gig performer than anybody I know. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. then I can just hit this, and this has the combination of both, right? And so wow. single note, and then I basically have a, a script, and I'll show what that looks like. Let me put that so back going back to my script window, right? So, uh, I, you know, it's funny. I, I don't get there very often, so I'm it's always like... It's a window. Window. Thank you, window. Yeah. And then and show then, current rack space. Yes, there we go. So this is a rack space script. So as you look here, you can just see basically any time I get A sharp one, from this MIDI interface block, right? Mm -hmm. Then it just, it sends it, but it sends it with the transpose. So mm -hmm. this is what's building those chords on top of there. Now people may say that's cheating. No, that's you trying to cover multiple keyboard parts that you can't handle with two hands. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and, and I'm a big fan of combining things and making them easier to make it sound more like the original or more full more rich experience for the audience and for the band as you're playing. And uh, like I said, some people might call it cheating. I call it the way I do things. And I'd rather, I'd rather focus on the performance mm -hmm. than on what, what some people might consider the pure way to do something. Right. Yeah. And if somebody didn't want to go through the trouble of scripting, you can mm -hmm. use Ripcord which is a great VST that will do something, something similar. Um, oh. David, did you want to pop on? Um, I'm going to pull David in for a moment here. Welcome, yeah. David. Hey. Um, yeah, I was just watching that because I used to do exactly the same thing 
uh, with the script. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, when Ripcord showed up, it's a very simple VST. You, you can basically define these are the notes that should be played when you press this key. These are the notes that should be played when you press this key. So you could just define all each, each of those uh, note event things that you have. You could just define those as a single entry in Rip. Uh, in, oh, uh, Rip nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, and it's a freebie. I'll have, yeah, I'll definitely have to look into that. Yeah. I was not aware of Ripcord, but uh, I, I, I don't think that was out at the time I originally did this on the no, old rig. Um, either. I found out about it more recently, but it will. it's exactly designed to do, uh, and I've done the same thing with actually more tricks because I've wanted to arrange when I play notes, I want some notes to go in the thing to go to one plugin and other notes to go to another plugin at the same time. So I could have a Taurus bass along with a string chord and a choir chord all going at the same time. So gotcha. you can just do multiple rip yep. chord instances. Excellent. I will, I will definitely look into that. Thank you for the suggestion. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, thanks for popping on, David. Uh, did you, uh, did you have another thought? Uh, yeah. I was just curious. Ahead. Um, I, you, you met, you mentioned, and I, other people might've noticed this, you're, you're, you're feeding, um, you're feeding, um, stuff into channel two and three of the audio mixer. Mm -hmm. How do you have that set up? Because normally they're pairs one and two, three and four. Yeah. And that's you... because the very first, actually it's not into two and three, it's into three and four. One is a one two is a mono channel, so it only shows up as a single channel. Oh, you oh you have it changed that way? Yes, oh, yeah. Oh, so oh. yeah, channel uh, one is always me, mono. We, should, we may yeah. want to make that more obvious so one yeah. can see that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, no, it's 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 set up mono very specifically. So when I'm using vocoder or guitar, or although in my guitar rack spaces I don't use a sixteen channel mixer, I only use a I think a four channel mixer. Um, I'm only going, I'm going mono, so I'm only doing one channel, so I really don't need the, the stereo. And I, I chose not to do the stereo feed on, uh, uh, on StreamYard today, just so I didn't end up with uh, not being able to have the auto noise canceling if I needed it. Mm -hmm. you're, you're making me think there's a little usability improvement we could do to make it obvious if whether it's something's a mono or stereo from looking at it. But I have a bigger question that I want to ask you. Yeah. Given the amount of gear that you're hauling around, mm -hmm. um, why would you not um, set up an iPad instead of having a massive big laptop in front of you when you're live? Because the iPad is the iPad is well. I guess I could take that and you know put that where the laptop's sitting, but I'm still going to drive with the laptop. An, an iPad. In other words, I am not prepared to use an iPad as my sound engine. Number one, I couldn't use. Gear no, 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 no. Oh, okay. Just you're just talking about as my display. Yeah, no, not even as a display. If you use something like Lemur to access widgets uh, and things and things like Next Song and so on, right from an iPad, instead of putting it right in front of you, which, you know, you could put it on a little pole by itself, it would just be much smaller right. and less like in front of everyone. So I've just wondered why you didn't think about yeah, doing that. That's 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 a that's a more down the road kind of usability thing. Mm -hmm. And okay. again, when I when I did this particular uh, exercise, right? Um, my goal was I've just got to get everything up and running enough to be able to gig with the new rig. Mm -hmm. But as, as my bandmates will tell you, and most of the people who know me will tell you, I'm always making usability improvements to my rig incrementally as I go. And it never stops. They refer to my rig as the, the, the Starship Enterprise, you know, the bridge of the Enterprise or the space shuttle. Yeah, on a regular yeah. basis, yeah. Yeah, I've heard that one before. You're not the first uh, <laughs> yeah. to say that, uh, trust me. Yeah. yeah. I I've, I've, actually, I've actually considered um, getting one of those LED, you know, you know those plexiglass LED signs that you can, like, do etching of words into that says NCC1701 and end cap it on the uh, on the on the Native Instruments Complete Control S88 so it faces the audience, right? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Cute. Anyway, I was just curious about the iPad because I was like looking at that massive big laptop right in the middle of your keyboard. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you yeah. face the stage, but um, yeah, I oh. I I I, I play at a ninety degree angle to the stage, so I okay. it did you know again because I I've had a tablet up there because we have a tablet a Windows tablet that drives our light show, and then we have a light person that uses uh, a a. a, a galaxy tab you know to to remotely control those lights 
that is actually what used to sit in that spot. But mm-hmm. now that I don't have this massive monitor sitting over on my rack, and I really didn't want the computer over at the rack. Um, you know, when it was the main guts of the computer were underneath that shelf, that shelf is where I put beverages. And I certainly do not want something to happen that it gets knocked right into the MacBook. So that's another reason why I stuck it up there. Um, yeah. is to keep beverages it out of are not allowed well. anywhere near my rig at a show. I mean, it's yeah. just, they're just... Those are just banned. The bottle of water with the cap on sits somewhere, but that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry to uh, interrupt. No, no, totally fine. We had somebody come on recently who uses uh, Duet. Anyway. Okay. Let me. So Mm -hmm. you've shown us all of these these things here. Let me get Mm -hmm. people so they can see your overhead. So you have the scriptlet that's running that triggers those chords. Yes. Um, actually, and... a script, not a scriptlet. Remember, this one this, is a script, yeah, right? Yeah, okay. This is a script. And I'm actually going to show that I actually, scriptlets are one of my new favorite features in Git yeah. Performer. And it's not because a rack space script or a global, global rack space script is not a good thing. They are great things. But I'm used to developing where I've got IntelliSense on everything. Mm. <laughs> and I make so many errors just trying to declare my variables sometimes that are just by nature locally scoped into a scriptlet that just makes it easier for me. Sure. Um, and, and I'm always for making it easier and quicker given all of the different things that I do, right? Mm-hmm. Of course. Yep. So, so anyway, and notice it says upper keys scripting and it shows that, that this particular up. interface is included in the scripts that are going on. Yep. And so that's, that's, you know, and it has the declared name of min for MIDI interface, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on, show a couple of other things. Here's what I refer to as a guitar and keyboards hybrid rack. Okay. So we do Pour Sugar on Me by Def Leppard. And I have two different jobs on that particular one, right? And so I'm actually going to switch cameras back as I'm as I'm getting my guitar put on as soon as I have it on and turned on I will yep there we go got guitar now so going back to the other camera so I'm responsible both for playing rhythm guitar on this song and I'm also responsible for um the the ganglin hey you know, huh, mm-hmm. hey right mm-hmm. so I went through and I basically used a you know studio one is my regular DAW of choice. So I just went through and created a few tracks at slightly different pitches of me doing those. And then I just doubled them up a few more times and pulled those samples over into contact. So when we start the song, you know, I'm going, (laughs) right? So that really gives a nice impact to that. And we're still saying those things or shouting those things in our microphones but it's a really nice augmentation for that effect. But then Mm -hmm. I'm also, you know, I don't know why my guitar is playing that low right now, but anyway, it doesn't matter. But you get the idea is, but I've got your gain is bypassed. Huh? Is it because the gain, the gain bypass, this is because this is the rhythm level, right? Ah, But when we get to that middle section where you've got the two guitars going, you know, one going, and then the other one does the power chord. That's when I kick on, the gain and it's right so um i'm the one responsible for for kicking up on that one i need to go in and revisit the the volume on that guy anyway but you know again using pedals right Mm -hmm. with widgets to control certain things from a guitar chain perspective i'm going to give another example of this real quick and then we'll come back to a couple other keyboard ones so um, we do this song, and I'm not going to call it out by name, but, <laughs> but, 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 but we do this song. And so I have a couple of different duties on this song uh, based on what I and our actual guitar player. And by the way, I do not call myself a guitar player. I would not insult real guitar players <laughs> with my hacking skills. Sure. I do, my goal is to do just enough to really enhance things 
and let the lead guitar player, the real guitar player in the band, shine and do what they do best, right? Yep. Um, and Antonio Roja, I've played with so many great guitar players over the years, but Antonio Rojas, our current guitar player, is just phenomenal, and I love backing him up. Mm-hmm. So, so no, initially, you've just got, right? It's just the power chords, you know. You know, he's playing those while I'm just strumming stuff, right? But then you get to the verse, again, that right pedal, this kicks on and off this almost kind of wah-wah talk mm. You know, so you yeah. do that. But then the last thing that I do, and I'm going to pull open the wiring on this so you can see how this works. So if you look... On the audio mixer, right now, you've got channels one and two muted and channels three and four active. And Mm -hmm. I've got two different instances of guitar rig going in. So instead of just doing some gain changes or something like that between tones, I actually use two completely different types of amp simulations. So if I want to get into that little cleaner piece, right, I use the left pedal and it switches which one is muted and which one is active back mm-hmm. and forth. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's okay. one of the other things that I do. And you're doing that via a script or you have them just mapped? That, to is, just, that is just widgets. So if you gotcha. look at the front panel on this guy, right, I have two of the left holds, yep. not okay. one. So one is connected to the mute on channels one and two. The other one is connected to it on channels three and four. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So, but without having to like have extra stomp pedals or a fancy pedal or something like that, I just consistently use my sustain pedals as basically active channel changing, turning effects on and off. And I've used the expression pedals before to do, um, you know, wah wah stuff. And, you know, mm-hmm. we used to do, uh, we used to do Sweet Emotion mm-hmm. by Aerosmith. Mm-hmm. I actually used to play guitar as the carrier through a uh, through morph odor from waves <laughs> okay and and i would use and i would route the microphone as the carrier and i used it as a talk box to do that sweet emotion you know wow, it's, wow. yeah so, so this is like another case for widgets as whatever it is mm-hmm. but it's like you know what because you're using widgets they can really be whatever they're just yes. another on off but got it. You got um, it. Okay. One other thing I wanted to make sure that we covered here is we're uh-huh. almost at 90 is right. You also send uh, information to your drummers. Oxygen. Yeah. Yeah, so- absolutely. So um, our drummer uh, has this 30 foot MIDI cable <laughs> that plugs into the MIDI output on the S88. We used to do this from the Motu Microlite 5. Okay. But that was another piece of gear I was able to remove from the rig because I was going back to using USB MIDI and you can route a secondary MIDI source through the S88's MIDI out that doesn't talk to the 88's itself essentially, right? Okay. So, which is fantastic. So if you look at the routing on this, right? Um, and I'll actually show this on something that we would have a specific drum set on. I mean, I have, I sent something to everyone. He has like a default set. So most songs get the default set, but certain songs have a specific patch that they need. Right. So if you look in the wiring, you can see I've got MIDI out to Octopad, Mm -hmm. and that is routed um, through the Complete Control S88 port 2 for MIDI out. And then you can see I've got, actually, I don't have the... I must be. You send no, here it is, right here. Yeah. Yeah. So here I am sending a program change uh-huh. and it's 89. So 89 is his Uptown Funk one, right? Yep. So, yep. but every single rack space has a MIDI out block going to the Octopad and we'll actively change that. And for certain songs that we do fast turnaround, him having to like go through and figure out where it's at, it would slow things way down. So, um, mm-hmm. for example, a lot of times, We'll jump directly out of a song into the Cupid Shuffle, which has a very specific, and it needs to start instantly when we go into that next song. Mm -hmm. So I just do this. He doesn't have to worry about it. Everybody's happy. Wow. So we got to get him on Gig Performer. That's the... 
that's the next step. I know you're you're a bit of a a gig performer evangelist. You you've I had am. many people popped over to gig performer. So uh, we'll follow up with you in a couple of weeks and see how that transition has gone. <laughs> um, okay, so and that's kind of like another cool use case. It's like you're not mm-hmm. actually um, playing the drums, but you are enabling your drummer to play the drums more easily. Yeah. And if I wanted to, since it's going to his MIDI in, if I really wanted to use that as a source for percussion on top of what I've got going on, right? Mm -hmm. I could do that. I'm not. I haven't done it to this point, but uh, I certainly could. Yeah, that's I actually didn't even think about that. So we got a question coming in about complete control. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess. So I'm asking this question out of ignorance. I see you're using contact. Have you ever considered using complete control? Uh, the answer I stay is away from it. What, yeah. what do you do? I steer away from it as well. I think for if I just want to go in search of sounds across the entire uh, NI, and I can't remember what they use, what they call the technology, because I know Arturia also, mm-hmm. uh, you know, participates in that, etc. I found that the overhead as a plugin from a live performance standpoint, it becomes a bit of a memory hog yeah. and a bit of a performance hog. And so that's why in my live rig, I like to keep things lean, mean, and clean. Yep. Um, and so that would be why I don't go straight to complete control. Yep. We got another question here. What do you use for lyrics? I send program changes through band helper, which also does the PCs. Do you use lyrics or do you just know them? I just know them. Okay. Um, you know, I occasionally when we've learned something very new that I've got a lot of different vocal parts on, I'll just use like a word processor and have that up on the screen. And like I said, I've had this Windows tablet sitting up there for years for running the lights. Mm-hmm. So if I need that, I'll put it on that. Um, mm-hmm. But but I don't do anything for lyrics. Mm-hmm. NKS. NKS, yes. Thank you very much. NKS is that standard for how you advertise your sounds to complete control to make it easy to find things. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dave. I wouldn't have come up with that on my own. So if you have any questions for Jim while Jim is here, uh, feel free to put them in the comments. Um, Jim, did we miss anything that is interesting? Just, just it. Two qu- and I never picked up the keytar, but that's okay. Okay. One thing I say with keytar, I, I love the, my wireless keytar. I use the yeah. Panda MIDI MIDI Beam, which I think is the best on the market. The build quality is a little low, okay. but the technology and the stability behind it, I've not found anything that. And I've 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 used a couple of the Alesis Vortex, the Vortex One and the Vortex Two. I always end up running into stuck notes at some point or something. Yep. Really, I've had occasionally a stuck note mm-hmm. with the Panda MIDI MIDI beam, but it, it, typically it's because I've accidentally hit the transpose button on my AX1, so it, when I release the note, it's not the same note uh-huh. as I pressed down, and so it gets stuck. So I actually have a button assigned off of that to the MIDI panic button. So if I need to do that, I can do that. But also, speaking of keytars, if you're going to use a keytar, I highly recommend that everything you have programmed on your keytar, just in case you have a keytar failure, whether it's your wireless, whether your batteries die, whatever it is, always pick a specific keyboard that has the exact same mapping of everything that you're doing on the keytar so that you can jump back to the keyboard and use it as a failback Mm -hmm. for that problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anything with wireless, it's good to have a bit yeah. of a, a bit of a backup or a battery even for that. Yeah, and like I keep a cord handy for my guitar just in case something goes wrong with my wireless, and I need to go wired because occasionally you'll run into those venues that are so saturated with stuff you mm-hmm. you can't really do anything about it, right? Yeah, we're getting a special request for your keytar demo. Can can okay. we make it happen? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um. um yeah. The one I have dialed up for this is, and I, I, I love this one because yeah. there's a story behind how this one happened. Okay. So we do, we do Bang Bang by Jesse J, yep. Nicki Minaj, and Ariana Grande, and, and all three parts are sung by our uh, amazing female singer, Jillian Brower. Um, give me one sec. I've recently redone where the power switch is on this. Actually, my mm. keyboard tip did it for me. The... Um, the original switch on this thing, the slider became so loose. If I started jumping around during jump around, because I literally do jump yeah. with jump around, it would slide off. 
and I'd lose. So, and I'd get stuck notes. I get, you know, that was another stuck note issue, right? Yeah. Let me pull up, let me pull up bang, bang. And so on bang, bang, and I'm going to back up here so you can see the guitar a little better. Okay. So on bang, bang, I've got, you know, the main two sounds through most of the song are this one and this one, right? So it's like, you know, you know, and then going into the chorus, you've got this little, right? Now, all of the voices on this entire song, Jillian came over to my house and I took her through a recording session in Studio One yep. to just capture all of these parts. Yes. And then I actually took each sample sliced and diced it all and then assigned everything to specific keys that make sense to me yep and then i actually did the samples with the effects processing i wanted because different samples sound very different and trying to route all of that mm. would have been a real pain so i just mm -hmm. chose to do it directly in the samples and so you've got that and then of course you go into the chorus bang bang until you you know so you've got yes. that right then you've got that hey you know, hey, hey, huh, that that happens in the song. Then, but but there's all, you know, and then you've got B to the A to the N to the G to the uh, B to the A to the N to the G to the hey. And then you've got and yeah, uh huh, you know. Yes. So, but but I have all of that mapped on the S88 as well, so that if I had a problem, I have an immediate fallback. I can just put down the guitar and and go yes so there is your uh there is your key tar demo i love it keyboard players are also now sound effect triggers um so i ask this question to everybody who comes on so if you do have another question for jim um feel free to put it there but um there, right here's a question you are using a behringer mixer right yes i am yeah. and and it has been literally i mean so rock solid the funny thing is so I bought the first one. My my uh, my sales guy uh, at Sweetwater, Alan Finkbeiner. He, I was I was wanting a new interface, and he goes and uh, literally I got them the first month they came out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 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 I go, okay, Behringer is not well known for reliability and mm -hmm. and and you know being able to take the rigors of gigging. What do you think? And he goes, the Behringer rep brought one in held it above his head and dropped it on the ground before he plugged it in to do the <laughs> demo. He goes, I know, he goes, I know our reputation. Boom. And then plugs it in and shows everything that it can do. Wow. Yeah. And the route, like I said, the routing capabilities are just amazing. So mm -hmm. I use, I use the XR18 for all of my live stuff. I actually do have a second one. So there's one in the new rig, one in the old rig. I did buy a second one like four months in because I was like, this has become such an integral part of my rig that I can't afford to be without one. And getting one, if I needed one, is going to take a while. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that's why I own two of them is just in case. And then I bought the MR18 not too long ago. First off, I, I had been wanting one. And with the supply chain issues we're all dealing with these days, mm -hmm. I wanted to get one while they were available. Mm -hmm. um, but I use that primarily for my home studio setup because the preamps in it are significantly better. I mean, mm -hmm. the, they are they are Midas designed preamps in the XR18. They are Midas preamps in the MR18. And the price difference really was not that much more. But the same software, you can buy the MR app or the XR app. It's the same app with slightly different skinning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Okay, this is the question. Everybody gets it. Same one every okay. time. All right. If you were going to give a new gig performer user a tip or a bit of advice to get started with gig performer the best way possible, what would you say to them? The community forums. <laughs> Seriously, yep. The, yep. the articles, the community forums, backstage with gig performer, some of the, I mean, the thing is, is that not just not just the people who originated this, but the community itself has built such an amazing set of documentation, resources. They're so helpful. That's one of the things that I love about Gig Performer, the mm -hmm. community. It cannot be beat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's 
it's stunning and shocking. Well, and I think it just kind of points to, you know, the fact that that's kind of just a unanimous agreement that I would say, I mean, at least 80% of the people that I ask this question to say, number one tip for getting started is going to the community forum. Mm hmm. Um, so that's awesome. I, I can um, tell you, um, the other guy that did the purple jam with me that shared my rig where I was yeah. playing guitar and he was playing the keyboards, yes. Vance Collins, mm-hmm. I, I'm, that's how I got him started. And I said, just, just go to the community forum, start asking mm-hmm. some questions. You'll, you'll be sold there. And he does have a license. He's still. Uh, we just temporarily lost you, but I'm assuming it will come back. Okay. Am I back? Oh, you're back now. Okay. You're I back. Don't... That happened when we were testing earlier. Yeah. Anyway, but, but Vance, Vance, uh, he does have his license, uh, and he has started building out his rack yeah. spaces. But we're we're talking about like making sure we use the same standardized plugins between the two of us. So if we needed to sub for each other, mm-hmm. we could do so really easily. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, this is uh, this is Vance's public call to action to finish setting up his gig performer rig. Right. Right. Um, well, Jim, thank you so much for being with us and sharing all of this awesome stuff. My um, pleasure. Massive, massive value. Um, friends, if you're watching, we will be back next week. Um, we will Next week, we're going to be going over the top things that people have shared over this last series of interviews. And the following week, uh, we will have special guest Andy Burton coming on backstage with gig performer as well so make sure you're on the newsletter um, make sure you are in the forum so that you can be updated and know what's about to happen jim thank you so much for being oh, with us my pleasure and, and, and uh, thank you so much for asking me uh and for imputar getting me involved in all of this and doing the the article on gig performer in action but no the community's great you all just just keep performing with gig performer it is it is the right stuff uh, Thank you. Oh, by the way, uh, Jim, where can people come see you play? Do you have a Facebook? Do you have? Uh, a... Well, so we we have both Facebook and then uh, uh, suburbanskc.com. Okay. Uh, so that's our website. It has all of our shows at least through the end of this year that we currently have booked. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and just go to shows there, and we're all and that actually just um, it just pulls a feed from our bands in town page as well. So. Okay. You can find us on Bands in Town. You can find us there. We're playing a private party this weekend, but really excited about this one. The following Friday, we're uh, playing on the main stage right before the, the headliner for the night uh, at the, the 2022 Plaza Art Fair. Uh, and that that's a nice coveted spot that we've been trying to get for a long time. So I'm really excited for that show. Awesome. So we're going to make sure that these things are linked up um, in the description. Um, David just sent it to me. So we'll make sure that's there for everybody. Jim, thanks for being here. Friends, we will see you all back next week. Um, Thank you all so much. Thanks.